welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion that these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. Question of the day. Does God use shame to correct us and change us? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson. And we want to thank you so much for joining us for this session of Chew on This. This week's discussion happened live on Wednesday night, May 4th. Yes, May the 4th be with you. And the building did celebrate. We have enough <clears throat> Star Wars geek outers. I have one in the in the the recording studio with me today <laughs> and I guess up in youth group they had a backdrop they had people we had a stormtrooper and Darth Vader for them to have pictures taken with all just because grown-ups are geeks around here <laughs> I love it yes so yes it was discussed Wednesday May 4th looking forward to continuing the series all summer I want to let you know that the sermon notes and the discussion notes the raw notes are in a handout format on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. I can't encourage them any more for any series than I can for this. Realizing that what we are discussing are taking our own opinions, other people's opinions, but studying scripture and see how we got there. And it's supposed to irritate us. It's supposed to poke at us. It's supposed to drive us just a little bit batty because that's what happens when we grow. The goal isn't for all of us to leave in agreement. The goal is for all of us to leave with this question of what does the Bible really say about these topics? Today's topic is God uses shame to correct me and change me. Is that a lie or is that not a lie? And so it was wonderful last night, Pastor Robin, to kick this off. It's a totally different feel than the study in Ephesians, which was the series we just finished. And there wasn't room allotted for any uh, Q&A on the floor because the goal was to get the case to them and have them chew on all those scripture verses and decide what they thought. I think this was a pretty tame topic. I don't think anybody out there was going to say, God uses shame, and I'm never talking to you again if you say he doesn't. There might be a few of those coming up, I'm thinking. Yeah, I know there is. And... <laughs> <laughs> but yay, this is how we grow. This is how we look into scripture and make sure what we believe isn't just something someone told us. Mm -hmm. But as best as we can, that we believe this is what scripture says. And the stuff we can interpret clearly, we leave alone. Mm -hmm. Like in the book of Revelation. There's only so much that book says. But I cannot believe the amount of study and organizations whatever dedicate to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But they make stuff up. Because it only says a few things that are for certain. The rest, you teach it, you have a great time. You go play with Revelation all you want. But you have to say, instead of, oh, yes, I have figured out this code and this is what this means. It's like, yeah, you know, there's just a lot in Scripture. We can think it goes this direction. We know these are what the root words are. We know this is what the culture was like. And this is where we're going to because we see a pattern of this author in scripture, or we see a pattern of this thought in scripture. So you can follow patterns. There are one of our, our best measures for interpreting scripture, especially if it's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's wonderful to see that, that we know that is part of the character of God, or we know that's part of the operating procedures of God, or we know that's part of the supernatural laws of God, because it's just there. It doesn't ever move itself out of scripture. So, so it was exciting. And interesting to watch faces you just I usually don't enjoy starting with some I don't know if you would actually call that a negative encouragement but telling people it's all right to get ticked off I'm expecting you to and people are kind of looking like you what are you talking about pastor oh <laughs> what do you mean this is just going to be you know a good way to categorize these things that people argue about or that we believe and don't tell anybody right so we're going to be covering both sides of this concept of lies but the whole process is to help people learn how to interpret scripture mm -hmm. and to not do that crazy stuff when this is what it has to say. Because when we get to that point, there's only a few things where, like God's respect for life, that's a big one. You can't murder anybody. This is what scripture says. Okay? 
And I'm not talking about war, because war isn't murder. People, yes, are dead. It's a totally different conversation. But standing on those things with that energy for things that really, really, that's where you're going to put all your energy. So it was really lovely having the <laughs> the reaction, because some I've seen some new faces that I don't think I've seen on Wednesday, so they mm -hmm. haven't had a chance to get to know us yet. Right. And, and the, the, the flavor of the Wednesday night crew. One of the things you did, Pastor O, that I really appreciate with this series is you gave us, with this series, the opportunity to take all of the notes. I can print those off and take them into my devotional, my quiet time for the week. And I can wrestle through those things and read those scriptures for myself and, and look at the references for myself and take any measure of irritation or comfort or whatever into my quiet time and, and see for ourselves exactly what the Bible says. So I love it. For me, this is just an invitation. Um, you roll something out uh, for us on a Wednesday night and we'll be able to take the rest of the week in our quiet time talking to Jesus about it. Yes. So this is yes. wonderful. And this this takes me back to a conference that we went to very recently where a Dr. Brashears said, when we're talking about different issues in scriptures, is this to die for? Is this to divide for? Is this to debate for? Or is this to decide for? And so as we're approaching all of these different lies, how we do that and how we work in relation to one another actually is a revelation of our commitment to unity in the body. Yeah, so right? Like, yeah. It's <laughs> so a good follow-up to Ephesians. It's a good follow-up to Ephesians. We keep getting back to Ephesians. So it's it's just been wonderful, and I appreciate his encouragement. So, Yes, I think I'm going to be borrowing his... his uh, what would you call that? It's not an acronym. His His wonderful listing of clarification exactly how yes. to sift just yes. how important this issue is and and there are some things in christianity we die for of course yes. there are yeah. but those are among all of the topics that are discussed relatively few mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and in today's age it sure seems like it's common to have this ginormous reaction to something that's really a personal preference Yes. You know, Scripture gives room for uh, people to come up with a number of different opinions. Yes. But there are other places where Scripture is very clear, yes. and we need to be united around those things. So yes. I appreciate that. Just sifter. It's like a yes. colander of Scripture. And all of this was supposed to happen within a community. Amen. Where you protect the unity of the community while you have these conversations. Yes. And the things that make us a community, those are the things you die for. Everything else in there is like, yeah, all right, so this is what I think speaking the truth in, li in love looks like. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's got to be this. It's like, no, that's very cultural of us. Yeah. This is the way it's handled over here. So there's different ways of, but the goal is speaking Jesus' truth. Not yeah. our truth, but his truth. And mm -hmm. figuring out how you do that. Anyone who's had the blessing of being able to help raise children and be part of the adults that form a ch ch children's lives can attest to that, that every child, there's some things that work with one that do not, of course, do not work with the other. You can almost guarantee yourself, if you have two kids, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And realizing the goal isn't that I follow my teaching method. My goal is that the child learns. Amen. The learning is the point. Understanding the heart of God. Understanding who God is. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Lie number one, God uses shame to correct me and change me. Am I right in thinking that's a lie? What do you think? You get to make up your own mind after we're done, and you can make up your own mind and take your time. But I always want all of us to be challenged that there are lies that we have adopted, that we have adopted, and we think this is what Scripture says. And it comes from individuals giving them to us, from our lack of reading Scripture and studying it, and from our lack of thinking it through. Is this part of God's character? So here we go. What is shame? Where does shame come from? Does shame serve any purpose? Is shame a sin? And what in the world does the Bible say about shame? All of these need to be answered before we can even approach this concept that God could use it as a tool for growth. Because what kind of tool is it? What is it? Believe it or not, there's a lot of different definitions of what shame is and what it's supposed to do. 
In scripture, in Romans 9, 30 through 33, it says this. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. They thought they could earn it being based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. New names for Jesus, if you didn't know that. We talked about that before the podcast. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Okay, so as Paul is penning that, inspired by the Holy Spirit, understanding the heart of God, will not, whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. That's the tattoo you put on your arm. There you go. So what does shame mean? Put to what? What other words could you substitute for shame? The concept of a stumbling stone, you can find that in Psalm 118, Isaiah 8, Isaiah 28, and Matthew 21. Very clear listed in those scripture verses. The concept of the rock of offense, you can find that in Matthew 16, 23. That's for all of us information geeks that I gotta see what else it says in scripture about that name and there we go <laughs> and here we go again the Bible says back on the concept of God uses shame to correct me and change me in Isaiah 49 23 it says this kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers this idea of family and caring for you with their faces to the ground they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet then you will know that I am the Lord those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Whoever believes in me will not be put to shame. Whoever waits for me shall not be put to shame. Different verbiage for the same process. And in Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame because there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. We amen on that last night too. Mm -hmm. Okay, back in Romans, Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been just about, blah, 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 blah. Yes, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. We all go yay. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, comma, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This nice little capsule here in Romans 5 has this equation that helps us understand a process. It, it, it tells us how to get to no shame. There is no shame in suffering that creates endurance in us, that builds character in us, the character of Christ, by the way, and the hope that is attached to that, the hope of living with God face to face. And that will not be put to shame. That we can count on. That is something that we can count on. There is no shame. So if that does not put, put to shame, if that is the antithesis of what creates shame, what in the world does create shame? We can't even begin to have this conversation until we get a common definition of what shame is. And I think everybody that was there last night would agree I did a really good job on confusing them on what shame means. <laughs> on purpose, wanting them to feel that, wait a minute, I'm so confused. Because in my own life, when I just don't get it, I put something down, I walk away, and it's like, okay, go take a walk, ruminate, come back, go do something. Because I have acknowledge that is a process of my brain growing, my understanding growing, my application of what I know growing. So this feeling of if you if you get that while listening to this podcast, hang on. Hang on till we get to the very end. Because this really is a one point podcast. We are getting to whether or not this is a lie about God using shame to correct and change us. So let's look at a Old school definition of shame. This is out of Noah Webster's dictionary from 1828. You can Google it and you can access it. And it's really fun because it is not the same as our current dictionaries at all. 
concept is there, but how they reach the concept and define it is totally different. Shame is a noun. A painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt. You feel guilt and then you feel shame of having done something which injures reputation. That which nature or modesty prompts us to conceal. The disclosure of actions which, in the view of man, are mean and degrading. So there's three facets, facets of shame here as a noun. That we have guilt because we've done something that injures a reputation. That something immodest happens and our culture says no, that is a private thing, don't bring that in public. And we do something that the tribe, the people around us see it as mean and degrading. You never should have said that that was so mean. So shame can happen in those three. Shame as we define it in America can happen from those three impetuses, if you will. The, the cause or reason of shame, that which brings reproach, degrades a person in the estimation of others. So it is something that others look at you and say, shame on you. You shouldn't have done that. That what you did hurt the people in this community. Shame is really connected to a community. If no one sees you do it and you don't feel bad, there's no shame. So people are really connected with this topic. It's a tribal concept, if you will. Another one, reproach, derision, or contempt, dishonor, or disgrace. Now, when we use shame as a verb, still in Webster's 1828 dictionary, to make ashamed, that we are actually doing an action that makes someone ashamed, to disgrace someone, or to mock at. We're going to see examples of mocking later in scripture. Now, when we look at the Lexham Bible Dictionary, this is how they define shame. And that is a uh, Christian study tool. You can access where it's from if you go online at realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. It's listed in the notes. So feelings associated with, but not limited to, failure, something society can have an opinion on and react to as, public exposure, where something private was brought public, and ah, yay, social media, <clears throat> disgrace, embarrassment even, Social rejection, where you just don't fit in that society, ridicule, and then dishonor. So what, how do we define shame? What, 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 what words do we use? Now those are words that we use in, in English, that we use here in the Western culture. Now if we went over to Middle Eastern culture, or Eastern culture, or Mediterranean, I think that was a old school Mediterranean culture, you're going to find that shame is attached to our public reputation. This is the ancient world or tribal world or patriarchal world, but I'll probably end up just saying Middle Eastern world or Eastern. We'll use Eastern and Western here in the podcast, the Eastern world. So honor is to be protected at all cost, not just your honor, but the honor of your family and your tribe, your people, your community. You have to be discovered and found out for shame to take place. No disclosure equals no shame. They have a word for shame in Middle Eastern languages, and it's aid. It's A-D, we would pronounce it A-D-E, aid. So if something happens out in public and the person in charge looks at you and say aid, you know you just shame someone. It's a shortcut. It's an easy way, instead of pinching someone or pulling their hair or smacking them on the shoulder, aid is all you have to say. And it's not just so you can know, it's so everybody in who experienced the shame factor realizes you are experiencing consequences and you know better and you don't have terrible parents and you're not a terrible person you're just stupid <laughs> that type of thing it lets everybody know so the whole community has an experience that the shame is going to be taken care of the thing that brought the shame instead of seeing you as someone they're going to stay away from because you don't understand this stuff you are not part of our community because you don't get this and you're not willing to learn it so they use that as a shortcut word. We did that raising our kids, having shortcut words when there was danger, when they were at a friend's house and they wanted to get picked up and they would call. This is before texting. Mm -hmm. This is before cell phones. They would just call and say, I think I forgot my homework. And that would be a sign, well, maybe you need to come home. You know, that type of thing. Giving them, we had kids who wanted to spend the night, but and that was me as a kid. I was probably almost in high school before I liked to sleep over at friends' houses and still then not very much. Mm -hmm. Didn't enjoy it. So shame, using that word aid, was a way to shortcut. That's how big shame is understood and how it is used in Eastern cultures. 
Now, there is this thing, I'm going to do my very best. It would help if you were there last night to see the amazing circle I drew on the whiteboard. It was amazing, was it not? Very Astro much. Oh, I tell yes. you, the amount of artistry in drawing a circle with a Sharpie or a eraser marky, marker. If I would have used a Sharpie, it all would have been sad. That's one nice whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> and I call it circle theory. It came out of one of the books I read. Trying to explain this concept of aid, of using shame to get a community to behave. What's interesting is I find the concept of community can transfer to any community, whether it's a family unit, a nuclear family unit, or an extended family unit, or a work family unit or a community family unit. I think it works in Western culture as well. We just use different techniques. So here, imagine a ginormous circle going around. Let's start with your nuclear family. It's easier to understand with that. And inside that nuclear family, just like we talked about in the podcast on Ephesians, you have codes, house codes. You have things that your family knows if you do this, this is going to happen. They're like community rules, if you will, but they're more like structure by which to live by. You, you need them. Are you living in a house where if you don't pick up your mess in the bathroom, you're going to get it? I mean, that's a silly one, but yeah, you know if you do. Do you live in one where if you leave dirty dishes in the sink, everybody's going to look at you and say, really, you're that lazy? Do you live in one where if you leave your shoes, all of them, every single pair that you own in the foyer, <laughs> what's going to happen? What? 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 Do you live in a family where if you don't read, you look, you're kind of looked at as brain lazy? Do you live in a family where if you don't work out, you're looked at like, really, you don't take your health seriously? Do you live in a family where personal grooming is paramount because you can't smell? Or one that's like, you know, you'll get to the shower after you get through all of this because you, you've got all this work to, you're just going to stink again. So these are silly ones. There are bigger ones like, do you live in a family unit where you can use curse words with each other? In my whole life, I've never lived in that family unit. I'm probably the world's biggest curse nerd. <laughs> because it's just never been around my life. And I was at an appointment with a person helping me with my health and they used one of the bigger curse words you can use describing an incident of something appropriately used professional person i'm like holy cannoli can you say that in these settings now i'm so sheltered <laughs> it's like no reaction face stay the same no reaction all this stuff going on the inside i'm screaming like what did you really say that <laughs> so yeah i'm in a different tribe right then and there. It's like, don't react. This is not my tribe. If it was my tribe, you would have gotten a lot of what, what? Don't you talk that way around me. Don't you talk that way around kids. People who use words like that are, give off these impressions. They are ignorant. That's how my tribe operates. Use your brain. Come up with something better. Don't be lazy. So those are the definition of, of, of who's in your circle. So if we say who's in your circle, the circle meaning your community, we do things that when somebody in that circle is disgraceful, like I just explained with cursing, and if they go to the edge of that circle and start having behavior that's outside of that circle, we go get them and we pull them back in and say, don't do that. That process of pulling them back in can be called shame. You are telling them what they did was wrong, telling them that they better get back here and change their behavior so they stay in our circle. Everybody does it. Everybody has it. Everybody watches it. We just don't realize we're doing it. Now, in Western culture, one of the ways we do it, instead of having this structure where we can publicly say shame on you, which is what aid is, but not like American culture, you better stop doing that. If you don't stop doing that, no one's going to be your friend. We use condemnation to bring people back into the circle. And I'm not sure if I like either one of those choices. So when we bring condemnation, we want that person to feel shame or guilt to stop what they're doing or to just feel enough it's not worth it and to move back into the circle. So the New Testament has two words for shame, and I don't speak Greek, don't study it, but I do notice it's in all kinds of everything, and it should be because the New Testament was written in Greek. And there is one word, A-I-S-C-H-Y-N-E, the E is a long vowel. And that word for shame is the kind of shame someone feels after committing an act the community saw and said, 
no, no. So, oh boy, I just crossed some type of law that I didn't know exist. I do this all the time in other people's tribal circles because I don't read body language well or something. I don't know. Maybe because I have an inner tribe circle that has odd factors of what I consider important. And I usually ask people to help me when I'm in a brand new community because I don't pick up on verbals like that. I don't pick up on, excuse me, not verbals, but reactions, body reactions like that. But it happens all the time. It's just there. So you can tell though when somebody, you did something really stupid. I can tell that I did something really stupid. I'm just not really sure what it was. <laughs> That's my problem. Let me correct myself. I can tell I offended somebody and I'm not sure what I did. And so I usually ask for help interpreting that. I used to just walk away and write that circle off my world when I was a kid because I'm not. So it's just been there, just me. It's like, I don't know what I did. So there's that. Then the next one is, it looks like adios, but I know it's not because it's Greek. <laughs> it's a dos, it's A-I-D-O-O, long vowel S. And that describes the sense of shame people feel before, before crossing a boundary. Oh, if I do this, there's going to be a hard time. If I do this, my parents are going to feel this. That sense is a different word. So those two words are both in the New Testament. So the concept of shame that we understand here in the Western culture, as well as the Eastern culture, is definitely present in the community of the disciples. So what is shame? Where does it come from? Does it serve any purpose? Yes, we are heading towards one point. All right, I didn't wrap that up nice and put it in a drawer for us yet. So there are a couple examples here in Scripture in the New Testament that talk about community-based understanding, that circle theory of shame. And here in Matthew 1.19, talking about Joseph, it says, Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put Mary to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now we'd have to have a huge discussion about... Uh, Eastern marriage rituals and all of that and the community and how they created a family unit and how they took one family to the other family. Beautiful, worth your, your personal study time to go see what the whole marriage ritual was back in the day because it's a year of this and doing that and all of this. So they were engaged or betrothed at this time. They were not living together as man and wife, but Joseph was proving that he could take care of Mary to her family, that she wasn't going to be married to someone who's just going to walk off and leave her destitute. So he was in that process, and that's when the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she gave God permission to, because he asked her, which is crazy in its own. That's a whole nother podcast series. <laughs> and so he didn't want to bring shame on her or her family, realizing that if he did that, if he brought her out publicly and said, blah, 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 that he was thinking that whoever was the father of this baby could marry her and then that would take care of it. Or he could have married her and just took the baby as his own, even though he knew. But he didn't want to do that. He figured the other one just quietly not make a big deal of it because he didn't want to stigmatize her family for the rest of their life, that they had an immoral child. Because, of course, that character flaw is in all her siblings and then in all her siblings all her nieces and nephews and all her great nieces and nephews and all her own children and it must have started with their parents so even the aunts and uncles so that framework is we're going to stay far away from that family and not marry into it because we don't want to deal with that because that's a really big infracture that's a really big step outside of the circle of our tribe and he didn't want to do that to her. That's the culture. He understood it. Very appropriate response. That's where the angel of the Lord came and had a talk with Joseph. He's like, Joseph, you're a good man. You can marry her because that's my baby. And you're going to be raising my son or God's son. Which I think is, I mean, like you say, a whole separate podcast. But I think it's absolutely fascinating. We watch Joseph's protection over Mary. He didn't want to put her to shame. Correct. But because he chose to marry her, he embraced any potential shame to himself. Yes. Yes. Because forever people would say, oh, huh, huh, you guys beforehand, before mm -hmm. you were supposed to. Yes. And, you know, if they chose not to recognize the... Um, uh, 
divine nature yes. of what happened to Mary. Yes. So, wow, I just have an even greater appreciation for his protectiveness of her um, to deflect that, any of that, to come on to him. Yes. Wow. Understanding his culture and shame. Yeah. So this is where the Bible, how it defines it. So when we're reading scripture, we're getting this understanding that shame isn't just a personal thing. It's right. definitely a community thing. Right. Which traveled, which transfers fairly fairly well to the Western definition of well as well, because you need other people. No, not all the time. 50%? I don't know. Hopefully you don't ever need other people to feel shame when you know you've done something that you never should have. Mm -hmm. But here there is that definition. If other people see it and say you're disgraceful, that's shame. But as we just stated, the New Testament has both definitions. So here in Luke 13, 10 through 17 is an interesting one where Jesus is in the process of, of healing someone on the Sabbath and the, the problem that ensues because of that, because it's a different kind of shame. Here, they're trying to shame Jesus because he is stepping outside of their circle and doing things that they know, that's me pounding the pulpit, they know is wrong in God's name and he shouldn't be doing that. That in their mind, he is sinning, right? So here is the issue. This is all one tribe, one circle of people. This is all one community. Jesus is in public in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and worshiping God. And there is a woman who has been disabled for 18 years. 18 years she hasn't been able to stand straight. And when Jesus saw her, she didn't initiate this. He called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. Could you imagine the craziness of that happening in a service like that? Well, it happened to be the Sabbath. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And, you know, all the craziness ensued, glorifying God. Oh, yeah. And But the ruler of the synagogue was indignant, and his followers, because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Jesus, what did you do? There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and heal. Don't do it on the Sabbath. <laughs> okay, imagine that. This woman, everybody knew, has been walking like this. She's part of their community. They see her and they empathize with her pain. And they see, and they're in the house of the Lord worshiping him. And Jesus looks at her as a member of his community, of his tribe, and says, Sweetheart, in God's name, you are freed from your disability. Well, in my name, he could say, but you are freed from your disability, he said. And then he put his hands on her. And so were they mad at him for speaking it or touching her? I'm not quite sure, but he did all of this on purpose to teach and train us. And this is his point here. They're just mad because he's not doing what their circle says is right, what laws say is right. And he's looking at them thinking, you're hypocrites. Really? You're getting down my throat? for healing a member of our community, our tribe? Do not each of you on the Sabbath untie an ox or donkey from the manger and lead it to water? Don't you water your animals because they would die if you didn't? And ought not this woman who's a daughter of Abraham, who's Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed on the bond, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, like you're a son of Abraham, she's part of your family. She's more important than your donkey. And you can't even... See that? So he is changing the community structure, changing what the circle looks like, and they're not having any. But what's interesting is, as he said these things, all of his adversaries were put to shame. It says it right there. They were put to shame because all of the people around them started rejoicing because it had to be quiet. It had to be so quiet when that synagogue leader said, Jesus, what are you doing? You have six days to do that. A great big shame on you or a great big Abe, whichever one you want to use. And he's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're talking about a law that doesn't have application in this manner, a law of worship. Which glorifies God more? This is my interpretation. Which, that I wait until tomorrow or we here while we are worshiping, watch God's power in this woman's life. That's exactly where my mind went. The idea when he talks about you untie your ox and your donkey from the manger and lead it away to water. So for me, Jesus is saying, aren't burdens relieved on the Sabbath? 
<laughs> we do that for Good. our livestock. Good. Yes. Why would we Preach not it, leave burdens yes. for God's woman? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, in my very imaginative brain, I'm wondering: Was it a power struggle? He did this big thing, and the synagogue leader had to trump him. Was it a misogynist statement? <laughs> Just a woman. I don't know. Do we want to live in a world without shame? We all want to say yes, but do we? Is shame on you in a uh, statement of abuse? Can one be honorable without having a sense of shame? So where does shame come from? Mm. Believe it or not, I have an amazing equation at the end of the podcast, but you're going to have to go online and access the notes to see it. I will explain it to you. But it came from this question, well, where does shame come from? I want to see what it looks like. I want to see the formula because everything is math, all right? <laughs> everything is math. So where does shame come from? In Hosea 4, 6 through 7, it says this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. So does God shame? If you use that as your verse, you would say, well, yeah, he uses shame to tell us you're dope, you big dope, you, you sinful dope. But is that, did God shame them? Lack of knowledge, rejecting knowledge. They forgot about in the circle, in God's circle, they didn't live according to the code of that circle. So is that God shaming us or is it a consequence of our choice? Can, does God shame or is shame a consequence in our life from something we were the impetus of? So where does shame come from? 1 Corinthians 15, 34. It talks about, we're in danger every hour. I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, and I say this to your shame. He is talking, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and I, yes, I controlled myself and didn't call them the naughty, naughty <laughs> Corinthians. A, a, an amazing church in the city of Corinth, and Paul's love and care for them, and he's telling them that you are living as the world, you're not living sharing Christ. And I want to let you know that I am so proud of you, but you are not telling people about the resurrection. You are not telling people all about scripture. You are just sharing this piece of that. You are not living your Christianity. And I'm telling you, I'm ashamed of you. So is Paul shaming them? Is he saying, shame on you, naughty, naughty Corinthians? <laughs> or is he saying, your choices have brought this consequence, and that consequence is bringing you shame? Let me bring you back. Yep. Yep. So Philippians 3.19. The end is their destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Focusing on earthly things brings the consequence of shame. Titus 1, 10 through 11, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach teaching their own gospel, not the Bible, that you can earn more of God's favor by getting circumcised. We would probably phrase it, you can earn more of God's favor by being baptized or by doing any activity to earn his favor. He loves us. End of story. Anything that anybody tells us we have to do to earn God's love and salvation, if that was ever possible, Jesus would never have to have died on the cross. Mm -hmm. So any of that connected there, teaching their own gospel, not following the Bible, that brings shame. 1 Peter 3.16, Peter's in the game now, having a good conscience so that when you, you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, like the example of Christ in the synagogue healing the woman. His reputation just put everybody who was complaining about what he did to shame. Those who slandered the reputation of the godly, the consequence they're going to receive will be shameful. 1 John 2.28, John jumps in. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. He's letting us know he's coming back. 
I'll be right back, says Jesus. And living in his circle, anticipating his second coming, the stuff we do when we celebrate communion. When you don't do that, you are not abiding in Christ and there will be shame at his coming. So a shame the result of sin. A shame a consequence of a sinful choice. Can shame be removed? So is shame a sin? Proverbs list it in all kinds of things. Talking about parents, uh, children to parents, that holds. All of this, there's a, most of these listed here in Proverbs are about child to parent. Understanding the culture in which they were written. That you live in this circle of your family and when you don't live within the confines of their rules or their structure, there's a sense of shame on the family. You are saying we are not good enough. This is not right. This is so it goes in in Proverbs 10, 5, 13, 5, 14, 35, 17, 2, 18, 3, 19, 26. All of them talking about when wickedness come, contempt comes also. This one, I just just grabs my brain. And with dishonor comes disgrace. So there's wickedness, there's sin, and then contempt. Contempt is a no-no. When contempt is in us, we know we need to do some, oh, Jesus, help me. And with dishonor comes disgrace. So this behaving without honor, you're disgraced and so is your whole circle. A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully. And he's going to be sharing in the inheritance as one of the brothers instead of this person who wouldn't live within the confines of the code of that circle. So shame is an interesting concept and in how it appears in all structures of community. You have people, shame is present. All of us have it, every single one of us, from a sports team to the military to everyone has it. We all have a structure, and that structure, if not followed, the consequence of our choice to not follow, whatever that is, ends up in shame within that. You may not agree with the rule, but if you're in that circle of belief or in that community, everybody around you does, and they're looking at you like you're full of shame. Appropriate expectations. Oh, or maybe good. not yes. even appropriate, but yep. these are the expectations of this particular group. And when we don't honor the expectations of the group, the group has a reaction to get us back in line. Yes. For the health of the whole. Yes. Okay. Yes, to operate mm -hmm. and to be able to live together. Because mm -hmm. if everyone in a circle is doing their own thing, you're not a tribe. You're not in a circle. You're mm -hmm. just a bunch of people hanging out. Mm -hmm. It makes it way, you can just walk away without any responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't do well with family structure, whether it's nuclear family or community family. So here is the example I said earlier in the podcast about the use of shame towards Jesus, Jesus experiencing shame and what it looked like. So the word here used for shame is mock. And once I read a few of these, you're going to understand the intent of the individuals was to shame him because he is where he's at and the, most of them are dealing with the being arrested, the whole thing before his crucifixion. So that whole time in front of that, most of this is dealing with that. In Matthew 20, 17 through 19, Jesus is walking with the disciples, heading to Jerusalem to ce celebrate the Passover. And while he is there, he, while they are walking, he is telling them that the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. So I wonder how much this echoed later on, with what, 48 hours later or whatever and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And he actually uses the phrase to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. So Jesus knowing what was coming. So in Matthew 27, 29, it says, they mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. That's when they put the crown of thorn on his heads, put a reed in his hand, kneeling before him. Oh, here's the king of the Jews. And they, yeah, okay, you talk about mockery. Mark 15 says that they mocked him and they stripped him of his purple cloak and put on his own clothes. So they mocked him the same type of phrase, same type of time as Matthew was addressing in Matthew 27. Mark 15, 31 say the chief priest and scribes mocked him to one another saying, ha, he saved our others and he can't even save himself. Yeah, son of God, right. That type of phrase. Okay, so Jesus knew all this would be going on. And Luke says, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. 
which is unbelievable, shameful behavior in that culture. It was the worldly attempt to tell Jesus he really wasn't the Messiah. <laughs> Sorry for the squeaking. The, I was the, just moving the, around a little bit. There we bit. go. I apologize. No, those are my bones. <laughs> That's what happens when you be 60. Oh, I'm stretching. Creak, creak, creak. Oh, we can. We now can have sound effects. Oh, Look at this, Pastor Robin. In Luke 22, it says the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. Who's this hitting you? Who's this? All right. And in Luke 23, it says Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt. Here's that wonderful word we read in Proverbs, contempt. Contempt is a big, dangerous expression. If we know it's in us, it's a feeling in us, we need to back up the truck and examine what we're doing. It could be a yellow flag turning and an orange flag turning really quickly to a red flag. But it said, they treated him with contempt and mocked him. And then they put on all these beautiful clothes and sent him back to Pilate like, aha, here he get, here's the king. You get to deal with him and decide what his, what his punishment will be. So you get to decide justice, Pilate. So seeing how scripture defines shame on all of those verses, would our Heavenly Father ever do that? as a weapon to put you back into the circle of his code, to put you back into his family? Would he use shame to say, no? Would he have contempt and say, you miserly little earthling, you miserly little human, you get back there before I have to yank your hair? Would he ever use derision? Would he ever use contempt? Would he ever use anger would he would he use that as a way to help you grow as part of his family proverb 3:12 says this for whom the lord loves he corrects just as a father the son in whom he delights one more time proverbs 3:12 for whom the lord loves he corrects just as a father the son in whom he delights so if this is the character of god how does the use of shame enter into his relationship with the children that he delights in? He delights in you. You are the delight of his heart. We as human beings have an essence of God in us. We have a lot of God in us. We have our supernatural spirit <clears throat> is God breathed in us. So we have that in our character. Would a child in whom you delight, would you walk up to them in contempt and say, you're disgraceful? Get back over there, and I don't ever want to see that behavior again. Stop it right now. Now, some of us have seen it. Some of us have said it. Some of us have experienced it. But would God use that? Is it effective? Is it effective in a child whom you delight? You want that child to know, I delight in you so much. It doesn't mean that God lets us get away with bad behavior, no, or that sin doesn't have consequences. No, no, no. We're talking about this concept that God is specifically going to use shame to correct you and to make you change into the person you're supposed to be in Jesus' name. So my, my, my question is, what does correction feel like? So scripture definitely says he corrects us. So what does correction feel like? Is correction, does it feel like shame? Now let's look at the word conviction. What is conviction? Is conviction shame? Conviction can be defined like this in the Word Study Dictionary by AMG Publishers. It says this. It's a verb, obviously an action word, meaning to argue, to convince, to convict, to judge, to reprove. Is there shame in arguing, is there shame attached to convincing? Is there shame in conviction? Is there shame in judging? Or is there shame in being reproved? It refers to the clarification process of people's moral standing. It's a process. Conviction is a process. Clarifying that we in this circle, this is what we value. You can't treat kids that way. In this Circle, this is what we value. You can't treat adults that way. In the circle, this is what we value. You need to think better of yourself because I won't allow you to think of yourself that way because God doesn't think of you that way in this circle. So conviction, clarifying our moral standing. So do we mistake conviction for shame? If you're nodding your head, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> so conviction leads to guilt. 
Do we ever want to live in a society without guilt? I don't think so. And if there's no repentance, there's shame. My equation. Find my notes, you're going to see my math equation. Conviction goes into guilt. You add no repentance, it equals shame. Now what happens if you get conviction? Argue, convincing, conviction, judging, reproving, and you feel guilt and you go, oh, Jesus, I am sorry. That was me embracing contempt. Jesus, I'm sorry. That was me devaluing another person. Jesus, I'm sorry. That's me wanting my own agenda instead of respecting what Scripture says. That's repentance. So conviction that goes to guilt and you add repentance, you get forgiveness. So is shame sinful? Is shame a sin? Here is Paul having an argument in this process of defining shame he's bringing he's talking to those Corinthians again and he's saying you know there is this process we have in our circle of influence where if you have a disagreement and I mean a big one where he took my my horse and that's my horse he stole it from me and the person said, I didn't steal from you sold it to me I have the receipt of exchange and instead of handling it within their circle so it can be handled with the rules that they're tribe in their community has, they go to a Gentile court where they know they have a better chance of convincing people who don't understand their community to adopt their side and belief. And they'll either get the horse or some money. They're looking at big payoff, cha-ching, 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 one or the other. So Paul's going, hey, you know what? We're a family and what you're doing embarrasses each and every one of us. You have made a choice, and I am telling you, bringing conviction, telling you that that choice isn't how we operate. You have a process we already have established, and it's going to find the biblical answer to what you're doing. Is someone lying here? A court's not going to do that. They're going to attempt to try, but... No, I would, this, is, this is what happened. This is both of them have a good case. But this concept of proving someone's lying, very complicated. So here in this circle, is someone lying? I remember seeing that, that horse part of your family. Now, why is there an argument? Isn't there something at the core instead of the horse? What if there are relatives? And way back when, this one got more inheritance than the other one and, and was supposed to give the other one something and didn't the other one went and got the horse to make it even? Well, there we go. Here in our circle, we can figure that out because we know your history. We know your character. We know you. You going into a court that isn't related to our circle, that court is not going to go back into your family and understand what's good for everybody. It's just about you too. Life isn't just about you too. Shame on you. And he says this. I say this to your shame. He says that right there in 1 Corinthians 6, 5. I say this to your shame. So is Paul shaming them? Or is he bringing conviction? So we do we really mistake conviction for shame? And then start finding conviction. Oh, I can't have that feeling. That shame. That makes me feel bad. That's a trigger. That's whatever. It's like, mm-mm. There are things that are shame, that shame someone gives us that we're not supposed to accept. There are things that may trigger us because of experiences in our past. But conviction doesn't do that. What a gift from the Lord. Conviction is such a wonderful gift from the Lord. It is an opportunity to learn. Yes. And then I have a choice. Yes. Yes. I can either learn from it or not learn from it. I can either repent or not. But what a gift, conviction. Yes, I get to decide if this is a code I want to live my life by. Exactly. We all have them. Yeah. Too often we pretend they're invisible, but mm-hmm. they're not. All of them bring consequences. Mm-hmm. Good mm-hmm. ones, bad ones, mediocre ones. Mm-hmm. So here is Paul. What does he do now? Here is probably the best example within the circle of Jesus' family. Within the family we are creating as we live as a church community is a family you try to create with the people in your, your core group. So here is Jesus having a relationship with Peter. Now let's enter into this process of the last week of Jesus' life. They are experiencing and celebrating the Passover together. They're enjoying this hospitality of, and hospitality does, it creates community. They're enjoying this kinonia, if you will, this coming together and and being family and celebrating one another and celebrating Passover, this, this high esteemed 
event that they were to remember. So they're celebrating this holiday, if you will, and it, it brings them together. And they're having this meal and enjoying one another. And Jesus is letting them know that they had gone, they were done with this amazing meal. He washed their feet. They were having this amazing experience. And Jesus said to them, you all will fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, oh, no, you know, and then he says, and I will be raised up and I will go before you to Galilee. I mean, you never forgot anything he said to you because <laughs> there were clues and everything about what was going to happen. And all of them had to go, what, what, Jesus, what, Jesus, you, you, is he saying crazy stuff again? And Peter looked at him and said, these other may, but not me. Because right now they were 11 disciples because Judas is out of the picture by this point. You know, these other 10, maybe, Jesus, but I'm Peter, not me. You have worked hard with me. I've worked hard with you. I'm never going to fall away. And Jesus pauses. And I think that they walked in. They did something in, in pregnant pause. My imagination. And he says, truly, I, I tell you, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows in the morning, you have this night, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter had to be just indignant. Even if I must die with you, Jesus, I will never deny you. And all the disciples chimed in. I mean, oh, it had been scary to hear Jesus say these things and you're there and whatever. And I was like, oh, so we just go ahead a few hours. Jesus has been arrested. He's inside whatever building and there's a courtyard. So I'm assuming it's someone's house. And they did it in secret, so they went to have this, this group of people that were, were there trying to stand in, in support of Jesus. They wanted to do all of this behind closed doors. And here in the courtyard, the people can hear what's going on inside the house. And I think it was the courtyard of the chief priest. I'd have to go back and check my notes and read through it. But it makes sense because I remember that this is a place that John the Apostle had to bring Peter with to get him into. It is a courtyard that Peter in and of himself couldn't get into because he wasn't connected to the people in authority that way. John was, his family were friends. They knew the chief priests and stuff like that. So John's family was integrated into this. So they would see John and they knew John came and went out of the house anyway. So they believe Peter got in there because of John. And Peter wanted to be near Jesus. I told him, I'm not going to deny him. I'm going to be here. But as he's hearing what's going on, the stuff we talked about mocking, this, the anger coming out of that house, watching people, the sense of contempt growing in the crowd for Jesus, the sense of anger, that, that ick that happens with, with mob mentality. And there was a, a servant girl that came and said, you, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. And he said, no, nope, no, nope, I don't know what you mean. No, nope. and he moves away. And then he went out of the entrance to the entrance and another servant girl saw him and she said to other people, not just him, this man, this man was, was with Jesus of Nazareth. I recognize him. Now in my imagination, Peter's a big dude and it would be easy to pick him out in a crowd, but that's just me making an imaginative thing in my head. And so she said, I, I knew he was. And then he denied her with an oath, which, which is almost like swearing. I do not know the man by the whatever, whatever of me. And a little while, and after a little while, a bystander came, bystanders, a group came up and said to him, certainly, you're one of them. Your accent betrays you. We can tell by your accent. You're from there. What do you mean? You're just hanging in this crowd and you have the accent and you're not one of them? And then he began to invoke a curse and he actually swore, said something that was not appropriate to be in that circle. I don't know the man. And immediately, scripture tells us a rooster crowed. At that point, Peter was broken. He ran out and he wept bitterly, it said. That is a beautiful poetic way of saying his whole inside was tore asunder. Now, it's crazy to think that we understand what Peter went through and the fear that he felt while he was inside that courtyard. Mm -hmm. Lest we be too hard on the man, Peter left his original circle of influence that he was born into, his family tribe. When he adopted following the Messiah, that was ripped. His family came from historic, historic Hebraic community. Jewish. And here you're saying this is the Messiah. So there was a divide already. I don't know if, if Peter was already disengaged from his family. I don't know if the family disowned Peter, but Peter already made a choice to go from one circle, one family into another. He bet 
his money that Jesus was the Messiah. So he was able to, and he did this with an honest heart. So while he's in that courtyard, he's watching his patriarch dying, and he's supposed to be the one that is supposed to, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to work this way. Jesus isn't supposed to die yet. We're supposed to build a community. We're supposed to have all of these. We're supposed to prosper. We're supposed to create safety. We're all supposed to do, there's supposed to be a whole lot more that happens according to the way East uh, Eastern culture works. This guy, they're going to kill him. Now, everything I've worked for, I left my family of origin to come to this family. I, how am I going to take care of my family? Because you did not survive without a tribe. It was your hospital. It was your police. It was your social security. It was your medical. You didn't survive without your family, your tribe. And so Peter's having, and he should be having a freak out attack. So there's all these things that are going through Peter that he says, I can't, can't lose Jesus. Oh no, I can't lose my family. And it's like, no. And then getting in the A and all the contempt and all these people saying, you're one of them, you're one of them. And he's denying and he's afraid and he's scared. And then here's the rooster crow. And it's interesting to note that Judas went through an extremely similar experience in that he denied Christ, but in a different way. We watch Peter have repentance as he's weeping. I don't want to be that man. I think as he wept, he made the decision, I'm staying in the circle regardless of where it goes because I know Jesus is God's son. Wherever it leads me, I believe in that process, he did that. And his actions would attest to it that he went back and went into the fold of the disciples. And scripture clears up as the timeline moves into the book of Acts. But Judas didn't do that. Judas went and it's like, Jesus, oh, Jesus, you're not moving fast enough. I know when you declare yourself Messiah and you take the rightful throne of David and you kick all these Romans out, I will be the treasurer of your kingdom because I'm the treasurer now of your followers. So I think you should hurry that up. I don't want to be an old man when that happens. I want to get to my job of influence and start doing my treasury stuff and wearing my fine treasury robes and being a person of authority. So you know what? We all know that's who the son of God is and that's what he brings here. I'm just going to escalate and hurry this up because you're so slow. I don't want to wait any longer. This is me and my imagination, all right? I believe this is pretty accurate though. And so he's like, okay, I am going to let... I know these guys want to know where Jesus is so they can arrest him when there's not a crowd. I'm going to tip him off and let him know where Jesus hangs. And he did. And he just happened. He just happened to get paid some money for it. Did Judas have gambling debt? I don't know. He loved the money. Everybody and Jesus included knew he was stealing from their treasury. And so, you know, Judas is lying to himself and he's, oh, I'm going to do this. But we know that Judas had an issue with what happened. He thought Jesus was not going to die. He thought Jesus was going to reinstate the kingdom of David. And he could be a man of influence. Because Judas went to give the money back to the chief priest. And they wouldn't take it because it was blood money, they called it. And Judas ended up killing himself over this process. He also had shame and grief, but he never repented. He never went back into the fold. I think Judas left that circle and that tribe way before he betrayed Jesus. So here we see two definitions of what conviction and what shame looks like. And where does the shame come in? Does God bring it or do we bring it by the choices we make? And the circle that we want to live in, where do we want to live? Who's our family? Who's our leader? So we see this, and it's not over. It's not over. Here's the process that Jesus used. After Jesus was resurrected, he's hanging out in the tomb. We see this in Mark 16, 1 through 8. He's in there, and here come Mary, 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 and Mary. All the Marys. <laughs> that was so and funny. So, yeah, but there, there's so many. And, and, and it's interesting. You do a word study on all those different people and who they are, you begin to realize how closely interrelated the disciples are. Mm -hmm. We do have a podcast on the disciples. I forgot the name we gave it, but <clears throat> it's an older one. And it's interesting. They are related, and they know each other, and they grew up together. There's a whole pot of them that grew up together. And so the, these women are there, and they're going to anoint his body. But when they get there, the stone is rolled away. And they're like, wait a minute, what's going on? And they're freaking out. I would freak out, too. We all would freak out. Mm -hmm. And then they see this glowing person, assuming it's an angel, but I believe it's the risen Christ, because he says this. I want you to go tell the disciples and Peter. 
Is he saying that Peter's no longer part of the disciples? I don't think so. I think he's saying Peter's going to think he's not part of the disciples. I'm not through with that boy yet. You go tell the disciples and Peter, I am going to meet them in Galilee. Because of that statement, we know this is Jesus. And they had a freak out and they were scared. They didn't tell anybody what was going on. They did go tell the disciples what were happening, though. And, and then John... <laughs> And in John 21, so here we see Jesus' care for Peter. I want you to know you're personally invited to come hang with me when I show myself in Galilee, boy. I want you there. And then in John 21, here we see Jesus having this reinstatement conversation with Peter. He is telling him, do you love me, Peter? Then I want you to feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? I want you to care for my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Then I want you to love my sheep. It is believed that he did three statements of love. To remind Peter, I know your three denials. You know I know. But we don't have to go into that. But I also know how scary that was. But Peter, I know the man that you are. And I know the man you're going to become. And you are being reinstated because of your repentance. You understood that you can't ever do again. That is a no. So did Jesus shame Peter? If God uses shame to correct and change, this is the primary example. If it brought correction and changed us into who he wanted us to be, this would be the example for Jesus to stick his finger in Peter's face and say, don't do that again. Get back in the circle. And he did do that, but he didn't use that process of shame. What Jesus did is outlined in Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. He didn't let Peter get away with his behavior. He told him, don't do that again. That's wrong. Sin. 1 Peter 4.8. This is Peter defining it. Later in his life, and he says, above all, keep loving one another deeply, earnestly, with, with energy and activity since love covers a multitude of sins. And I believe on that parchment as Peter is writing it, there were teardrops. Realizing, going back to this experience with Jesus, all that he has forgiven me of, what he did, he did make that circle of a family. He did make that tribe. We are part of that tribe that Peter was in, that Peter stayed, that he repented and went back and led so we can receive entrance into Jesus' family. Does God use shame to correct me and change me? After examining all this biblical evidence, I have to say no. By our definition of shame in the Western culture, no. He would never do that. Shame in and of itself is its own consequence, its own response. It is, it is the response that we have to sin. Shame in our culture is often seen as abuse, and God would never abuse us. He doesn't abuse his children. God doesn't abuse anyone because abuse is a sin. Shame comes as a consequence of our choice not to repent, a condemnation, not responding to conviction. Conviction is the alert, oh, here's my circle. I stepped outside of it. There's conviction. The rest, whatever happens after that, is up to us. That is God's part. So here we have another, Pastor Robin, we have another math equation. This equation is worth looking up the notes all on its own, have to say, me likes this equation. Mm -hmm. Looking at this concept of shame, God's supernatural law brings conviction. Man's human response, guilt. Man's spiritual response, no, don't agree with you, God. Man's human response, shame. And that can be our own shame feeling, but also others shaming us. God's supernatural law, conviction, man's human response, guilt. Man's spiritual response, God, I'm sorry. Help me, help me, help me. Called repentance equals forgiveness. God's supernatural putting us back in the circle. So here's my challenge to each and every one of us. How do we define shame? Is there any way on the planet that a father who loves and corrects because he delights so in his child would ever use that as a training tool? 
Thanks so much for joining us on this week's discussion on lie number one, the summer of lies, does God use shame to correct and change me? Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings and enjoy this discussion throughout the whole summer live. And don't forget, you can check out our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references. And please, no doubt this has probably stirred up in you someone who would benefit from this information. Feel free to forward those notes on to them. And today... Wherever we find ourselves, let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on this episode.